When I was four years old, I met someone who would affect and change my life in a beautiful, strong, enduring way, Margie Coates. She was my nursery school teacher and also a Sunday school teacher at church. She has a twinkle in her eye, which invites each person she encounters to join her in a smile. One Sunday, she danced up the hallway with great exuberance, singing, go tell it on the mountain. I was mesmerized watching her. Her absolute joy was contagious. As a teacher, she joined us in creating masterpieces with construction paper and Elmer's glue. She giggled with us, she listened to us, and she took us seriously. And within it all, she was always the steady, calming presence that we needed. Years later, Margie and I visited together, and I commented that one of the kids in my class, someone who always pushed the envelope, questioned everything, stressed every situation to breaking. This kid, in his adulthood, had become a Stephen minister committed to helping people through difficult and life-changing situations. We marveled together at what seemed to be an incredible change in him. We were silent recalling this young man as he was in his youth and recognizing this older man now. How could such a troublemaker be so kind and loving? And then Margie cocked her head and said, Kathy, never count anyone out. Wise, kind, compassionate, and oh so true, never count anyone out, including yourself, never. I have thought about this conversation over the years and about how Margie taught this to us by her daily life. She might not have spoken it with words, but she did not have to because she lived it and we learned it as we witnessed her unapologetic inclusion and her love for all, which was evident in her actions. Never count anyone out also means always invite everyone in. We see this in the scripture this morning in the conversation between Jesus and a scribe. A scribe hears the disciples arguing with each other and observes that Jesus answers them well. So the scribe comes closer and asks Jesus a question. Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answers, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. No other commandment greater than these, he says. And the scribe replies, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that God is one, and beside God there is no other. And to love God with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important, says the scribe, than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Scribes in those days were associated with the Pharisees, a group of Jewish elders who strictly observed the traditional and written law, including whole burnt offerings, 
and sacrifices. Scribes were known to have pretensions to superior sanctity. In other words, they thought they were holier than everyone else. And we have seen this throughout the Gospels. Up until this point in the Gospel of Mark, the interactions between Jesus and the scribes have been confrontational. The scribes accuse Jesus of blasphemy. They question why he eats with sinners. They accuse him of being possessed by and working for Beelzebub. They criticize Jesus because his disciples are not following their rules. They have their own agenda and they continue to force it upon others. In the other interactions between Jesus and the scribes, there is tension and discord. And this is why this passage is so important. It shows that there is another way to approach each other, even when our shared history as groups is tense and uncomfortable. Here is a new way to interact. And the scribe is the one who starts it. He overhears Jesus and the disciples. He doesn't walk past. He doesn't silence his ears to what those people are saying. He listens with an open mind and he likes what he hears. And so he engages Jesus in conversation. Given who they each were, this is a vulnerable step for the scribe. Now maybe it was a test to trick Jesus into saying something that the scribe could use against him. But perhaps there was something about Jesus that made the scribe feel safe. Safe enough to enter into dialogue about something that was important to both of them. Their common ground, the love of God. The interaction between Jesus and the scribe manifests the absolute importance of being open to all, all, truly. Do not let generalities get in the way of a meaningful interaction that might lead to a beautiful friendship. Make your decisions on your own for sure for those who you want in your life. But if you make those decisions based on external reasons, you will most likely miss out on an opportunity to experience a new way of thinking and being. Instead of rejecting a person because of a label, take the time to look beyond that label and see the love of God within them. Today is Reformation Sunday, the day we acknowledge that sometimes great change comes from standing up for what you believe. It is said that on this day in the year 1517, a German monk named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of Schlosskirche, that is, Castle Church. This was a list of Martin's suggestions of how to make the church less judgmental, more loving, and accessible to all. Martin wanted the church to get away from judgment and control. He wanted the church to stop trading forgiveness for money. Martin knew this is not how it works, hence the 95. And one of them, right there in the middle, number 43, reads, Christians are to be taught that they who give to the poor or lend to the needy do a better deed than they who buy an indulgence. An indulgence in, in those days was a way to have all of your sins forgiven just by paying money to the church. This system tended to manipulate people by preying on their fears of death. Give us your money and you'll be okay when you die. Pay us money and you don't have to pay attention to the person you harmed. 
Martin watched this happen, and it hurt his heart to see the church misuse its power. He knew in his soul that the church could instead help people in a more loving way. Martin's understanding came when he used his compassionate heart to advise his brain to think in the manner of love. He knew the church could make a more lasting and deeper difference by focusing on love. Love as Jesus quoted from the Hebrew scriptures, love as Jesus taught, and love as Jesus acted. Martin knew that the church would do better to teach people that when love is the base for people and for the world, then everything falls into place. He knew in his heart that if the church could love people, then people could live their lives in love. In Martin's day, reform meant to bring something back to its original condition. That for us is love. Love is how we were born, the one thing upon which all meaningful lives and traditions are built. When we get back to love as our base, then all is well. Love is reflected in our traditions. In the Jewish culture, a mezuzah hangs on the doorways of homes. Mezuzahs, like people, come in different sizes and colors, and they are made of a variety of materials. Each mezuzah has one thing in common, a scroll inside of it with words from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is who we are. This is love. We are called to listen and hear about it. Hear because this is really important. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Very simple and yet not always easy. But when we listen for love, and when we talk about love, when love shows up in all that we do, we have reformed ourselves in the best way, back to our original condition of love. We are beloved children of God, every one of us, every single person, regardless of how you feel about them, is a beloved and cherished child of God. You are a beloved and cherished child of God, regardless of how you feel about yourself. It can be easy to overlook our call to love and jump to the reasons why we should not be open to all, to focus on what we don't like about someone or what we are convinced they should change about themselves. Sometimes this mindset comes from not having enough information about someone, and so instead of taking the time to get to know them, we allow a generalization to be the truth on which we judge. But something is always missed, neglected, forgotten, ignored when we generalize. And we ourselves are also harmed by generalizations. Women are so, people who grew up in New Jersey are so, 
These forms of judgment prevent us from engaging others. If the scribe had looked at Jesus and the disciples and thought to himself, oh, those people are so, why bother? He would have dismissed them and never would have had the opportunity for this fruitful conversation. And the same for Jesus. If Jesus had dismissed the scribe and refused to engage with him, both of their lives would have been diminished. Instead of rejecting a person based on a sweeping statement, we are called to begin by accepting them in love. Jesus could not be more clear on this point. Love God with everything you have. Love God with your entire being, heart, soul, mind, strength. Use everything you have to love God, everything. Every cell of your body tuned to the note of joy that is God in this world. Every part of you, the parts you show proudly to the world, and the parts you try to hide from the world, every part of you tuned to the note of peace that is God in this world, and love your neighbor with this love, and love yourself with this love. Listen and hear that Jesus assumes that we love ourselves. Most of us know ourselves better than anyone else knows us, and that will often cause us to be harder on ourselves than we are on others. It can be difficult to love ourselves. We don't always feel worthy and we wonder if we are good enough. If you ever feel this way, remember that God knows you and God loves you unconditionally. It is easy for God to love you. You are worthy, you are good enough, and it is not selfish to love yourself. If it ever feels too hard to love yourself, try turning it around. Think for a moment about loving yourself in the same way you love others. Give yourself the same support you give to your spouse, your child, your parent, your sibling, your best friend. We have this morning three examples of prophets in the world. Margie, a present day prophet who lives a life that never counts anyone out and includes all people. Martin, a prophet from history who stood up for a more loving way to be the church. And Jesus, a prophet upon which our church is built one who loves and accepts all people. Life was not always easy for any of these three, and yet life mattered because they lived with love as their base, which makes the difference the world needs. Theirs are only three examples of ways to live in love. If you know your way of living life in love, awesome. If you are finding your way of living life in love, awesome. It is a good journey. Love makes the greatest difference, and you are that difference. Live your life in the confidence that you are loved wherever you are, whatever you are doing. God loves you, and we love you always. Thanks be to God for you in this world. Amen.